Frank, I'm so glad you could join me today. How have you been? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm being yeah, good. Absolutely. Being good. Absolutely. So I know you've been busy with Gunpowder Milkshake releasing on Netflix in the U.S. about, I don't know, I think um, two, three months ago, and then coming out in the U.K. in mid-September. Um, yeah, on the 17th of September. Yeah. Coming yeah, out. so, yeah. you know, beyond that, have you been keeping yourself busy or with that done, have you been uh, taking some time and just relaxing? Um, no. Uh, um, we kind of... Uh, when did we finish that? We finished that, I think, around... Um, when was it? We, we finished it fairly close to to when it got released due to, like all the COVID and recordings and when we were able to record and stuff. So, um, and I've been working on it for years. So I took a bit of time off, but I have a, my own kind of personal album that I've been kind of stacking away from time to time when I could dip into it. So it's kind of like, okay, there's a bit of a break now before I start to film and, and it's like, okay, I can do that now. So, and it was just also trying to re-rig the studio with all the synth and stuff to, to, because everything when we work on gunpowder was just a bit of a mess. So yeah, it's it's a bit of a free time to try and kind of get before things starts to pile up again in a month time. So yeah, not that's much funny. of a break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I feel like that's always the case with composers. You've, you know, you're you're getting run into the ground on a project, but then when the project ends, you just can't wait to get on the next one. Well, well, that's the thing. It's it's you know we're kind of freelancing so most of us i think nobody says kind of know when you have a gig coming in and such and um even the the one that you think it's a small gig you ended up it being a big gig because you then you invest a lot of time and you got to do this and then thing changes and evolves so it's it's always like no matter what you do you always kind of find yourself busy or you try to find yourself busy you know so either you write for a film or a tv show or anything like that or or then you kind of finally try and do something for yourself which i mean i i always kind of find that i write mostly for films and tv and you you barely kind of have the um, you know, the the kind of like when you have your time for yourself, the last thing you want to do is be back in the studio writing. So it's when you have a bit of a break and you think, OK, you know, I got a, a bit of free time. Oh, let me experiment with this. Or how about I'll, I'll try and do that. So that's where you kind of start to do something for yourself more than, you know, get a commission kind of a thing. So, yeah, it's a bit of a break is always nice. But, yeah, we're always keeping busy. <laughs> so I, I do want to get to gunpowder in a second, but. Before that, what can you tell us about the, um, like the personal music that you're working on that album? Is that really, is that you know coalescing into something, or is that right now just you kind of noodling around working on things that are for yourself? Um, no, I, I think I started it like maybe about I think, I think maybe it was about two years ago, and it it's it's very much I mean the same sort of vein of stuff that I write, which is always a bit of that kind of mental, melancholic kind of stuff. Um, so it's it's featured um, some of the pieces I managed to record already with an orchestra or more of a string, uh, string and winds. Um, and then it's, it's piano and electronics mostly. Um, so it's similar pieces. I haven't kind of reach the point where I'm saying, okay, this is like a concept album or, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. It's just kind of like writing certain melodies and certain uh, tunes that I thought, oh, that works with that and this works with this and, you know, I'll go with it and see. And then when I kind of started like thinking, oh, actually those pieces, they were written separately. They weren't like written for an album. But um, as I kind of listened to them, uh, it kind of made sense of, oh, maybe I should put it out as an album because it's not associated with any film or anything. And they they have a sort of similarity going between them. So it's it just made more sense to say, oh, you know what? Okay, maybe I'll do an album. But then every time you're thinking, okay, I'm just going to sit down and write these pieces out. And then, oh, I got this idea and I'll write that out. Something pops in. So Gunpowder came in right when I was like, okay, I have the free time to just concentrate <laughs> on the album. And that kind of took me for a year. So I literally worked on gunpowder mo oh, more wow. or less for, for a year because it went through the whole lockdown and um, 
we just kind of had in a way everything stopped it's like you know the whole world kind of stopped but actually we were still working on that um so you know we had a lot of time to experiment with gunpowder and kind of shape it to really the place we wanted to take it so um originally i think we were like i think originally we were supposed to go into recording within two months and then the whole pandemic starts and everything kind of locked down and shut so that kind of you know started to stretch and we were they were editing uh while uh, through the lockdown and while they were editing and reshaping the film i started the scoring stage but then everything kind of you know kept on prolonging so we ended up literally working on it for a year non-stop yeah Jeez. like avatar seven <laughs> <laughs> see that's crazy because so often composers will have you know six weeks eight ten weeks to work on something yeah so with that i mean what was the approach when you i mean did you did you hit a point where you realized oh we've got a year an extra year to work on this or was it you know, a, a month would go by and you'd think, okay, we're going to record and get this locked in a month. And then, and then it would kind of keep pushing off incrementally like that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was more the later. I think the idea was, um, I think uh, I, I kind of, I went on set it was November when they were still film. Uh, yeah, they were still filming in Berlin and I went on set and then uh, they, they, broke for Christmas and New Year. And then I kind of started, I think I started around February or something like that initially. I mean, I've done some sketches and some rough ideas where stuff were played for the actors during filming and so on. Uh, but but the bulk of the work kind of started around end of January, uh, early Feb. And, um, and the idea was that we, I think we were looking to record around April. So I would say it's probably about two months, more or less, to get everything done. But then, you know, March came and we were literally, we started to look at recording dates and started to secure, you know, like a, a bit of recording dates and things like that. And then, boom, the whole thing kind of started and then like, okay, everything stopped. Okay, everything got canceled. And we were, at first, we were, uh, we were not sure, like, are we going to record or not? Everything kind of stopped. Uh, so we just said, well, you know what? There's no point to record at the moment. And, uh, you know, just postpone everything and, you know, just keep on working and see how we do. So it kind of turned from just a normal kind of six weeks uh, period into like, you know, 12 months period. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. So you know, one of the things that I was curious about is at what point did you decide on the the style and the sound of your score because it's it is very distinct it's fit you have uh, very much of kind of modern influence sort of like spaghetti western and no. just broader like 60s 70s feeling and it, you know there's a lot of italian influence in there so i mean how did you land on that kind of palette um I mean, the idea is uh, those kind of ideas, I think, or, uh, they kind of started that, um, like Nevo, the director, is very musical oriented when he works. So he will already, you know, been, is, is going to listen to stuff while he writes the scripts. And um, so he kind of started listening, you know, to the usual suspect, like Ennio Morricone and, and uh, um uh Silvio Capriani and all these kind of Italian influences and stuff and we'll kind of start generating a playlist of of you know cues from films and songs while he was writing and then I'll get a you know we'll chat up and he'll say you know this is what I think the influences are and I'll say okay great so but have you read you know have you heard this score by Capriani or have you heard this one by um you know Henry Mancini or John Barry or you know I'll start throwing other elements into it and we'll start compiling this kind of huge playlist and um you know as he will kind of I think shape the script and then start filming that playlist will get more and more kind of um, um shaped towards the film and then you know I remember we were you know I came to Berlin uh to see the set and the actors and and you know, what's working and such and 
we were driving in the car and stuff and you know we'll play the songs you know through that and we'll go for lunch and we'll pull our iphone and we're like have you heard this cue what if you mean i think that could be a good direction for this and that and that's how we kind of started thinking of all these ideas and a lot of it was like you know coming like how do we do you know on one side we do singing in the rain akira kawasawa and we do you know alfred hitchcock bernard herman and Sergio Leone and you know Morricone and all these kind of stuff how do we shape them into something that will have its own character but for the film and create this kind of um you know an homage to all these films that we love but without kind of taking the piss and saying it's a spoof about you know what I mean which is what sometimes a lot of those things are you know and we didn't want it it's not a spoof so but we wanted to have those influences but still have those kind of um you know I, I would say it's like a unique another character in the film which is the music because it's so um you know you can't escape the music in the film when the both works you know in any of the if it was rabies big bad wolf the music is always another character and that's what's the case here and that thing was the main um like the main challenge of to try and do is to try and you know get those elements and still make it kind of original so that i mean i think for that i would say that's the only positive thing with having the lockdown and the pandemic <laughs> that we had the time to you know to kind of play around with all those kind of things i mean it, it drove the producer mad because it's like why is it taking so long for us to hear something so they had the main theme and they heard like the main thing which is what's kind of um what's opening the film and they were like, great, we love it, we love the theme, everything is great, but why is it taking so long to see cues, you know? And, and you know, that was the thing. Another point was, how do we do cues that are written to picture by frame, but they're going to feel like needle drops in the film without editing the film to the music, which what you would normally do, but the idea here, because they were so progressing, um, and then they stopped and there was no editor to come in and, and do it. The idea was do a needle drop, but match it to the film. So that's another challenge to try and, you know, to make those cues feel like it's just a track that somebody put in and it worked great, but actually it was written to picture. So yeah, it was a few challenges on this one. <laughs> so know. how did, that's something that that last point is something that kind of really struck me because there were a few moments in the film where I'm, you know, I'm listening and I I think, you know, I'm, I'm like 80% sure that this is an original cue, but there's a part of, you know, there's something in the back of my head that's not sure that thinks, oh, maybe this is a song from somewhere else, or, you know, maybe this is a, a cue from a score, you know, 50 years ago that, like, they've, they've just placed in. And so it's, it is really interesting that you say that because they do actually feel like a kind of weird version of a needle drop so yeah. i mean what was your approach in actually crafting something like that because it is i think a bit unusual for a, to do in a film score yeah i mean that's the thing is is some of the like when i watched some of the scenes um you know they they kind of played out like uh you know like they're almost like a like a video clip within a movie you know um so if it's the the gutter bulk, uh bowling scene or if it's uh the clinic fight um some of the the, the kind of um even the kind of big action cues at the end so the idea was um you know we tried a lot of stuff in and even the clinic scene uh which we kind of used the mariachi thing at the end um that was actually scored as a normal action cue but then you know we we kind of lost a bit of that comedy that that scene had in a way and um i think the first one that we tackle um i think was the 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 bowling alley kind of a thing and um you know we had the, the whole standoff before which is one cue and that was like that kind of spaghetti western feel to it already and um so so my approach was because i come from from a rock kind of electronic background for me it's more about yeah and being in bands and things like that so for me the i said okay so how about we we do like um you know we do them as a as a track and then once it's we kind of have the basics then i can start metering it and kind of 
shape it a bit with the with the tempo changes and stuff. Um, but but the idea was to build it as a you know like an A B A B A B C kind of you know just as a, as you write a song. So those cues were written literally like that. And then once I had the structure and we were like great with the melody and the, it's like a verse chorus kind of a thing, we we're all happy with that. The idea was then then to match it somehow to the picture. And and that I think worked as as um, you know, just as Nabot wanted to have those kind of needle drop feel to it. And it matches with the clip. That the, the hard part was like, yeah, to try and kind of match those um like to the picture, you know, but but still, so the audience doesn't feel it feels weird that there is a two bar and it goes into a five bar or a six eight, and those kind of feeling and the tempo is changing a bit too much. Um, so those was the hard part to kind of do. But we had you know great players and and Alex on drums that that like some of the breaks are two four and three four and he kind of matches those, you know. So and I. You know, I like the I like those players to more improvise and bring stuff, you know, that they can do in their own field than me writing down or Jeff, my orchestrator, writing down, you know, all these kind of notation for the drummer. That's what you need to play, you know. This is the guide. So, but they're they've done brilliantly. So yeah, and it and it just feels like a track and not as a, you know, as a, as a another cue within the film. Yeah. But I think it also works to give a lot of those sequences their own character. I mean, I think yeah. the the bowling alley sequence and the clinic fight probably are the, one, the two that stand out the most for me in that because, you know, both the, the, the action sequences themselves are, you know, they're unique set pieces, but the music as well really adds yeah. to that. And it, you mentioned this where the original take on the uh, the clinic fight sounded a little more just, straightforward action he took a little of the comedy out and i'm yeah. really glad you had that extra time because it is it is such a goofy fight scene it's i yeah. mean it is you know kind of silly and the music adds to that too and that's something that i was curious about is how do you find the balance between you know, leaning into the comedy of a scene versus having a little more serious because you know at the end of the day like it's also people that are Know, getting shot and stabbed and and killed and all that too. Yeah, I mean, I, some of the scenes when you do look at it, I mean, first of all, gunpowder in a way is is bigger than life kind of a film. You know, it's uh, some people, you know, a lot of people kind of compare it to either John Wick or you know, or these type of worlds. And but actually, it's it's not really. You know, like the only kind of scene that's kind of reminiscing you know a bit of that neon light is only the the bowling alley sun um lead wall that's in the back that's as far as it is a lot of the film is very kind of neo you know it's a film noir kind of um you know uh, very old 60s feel to it um and a lot of these scenes uh when you look at them they're kind of bigger than life it's more of a it's like a, like watching like a comic film you know it's like a marvel or something like that and um, you know that, that actually, I think the 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 boat. Uh, no, yeah, the clinic scene is the last one we actually recorded, and and it's the last one I scored because um, I wrote. The, I think the original cue that I wrote uh, was more kind of very similar to the monster one, which has like all these kind of sixty surf guitars, and it has those riffs. And uh, it was more action oriented. It had a bit of the comedy, but it wasn't. It just get it just made it more serious. And that whole scene where she's paralyzed and how the goons are, you know, they're it just it's just so ridiculous. And it, but it just made it serious in a sense that it just felt that we're not getting the you know the comedy or the kind of like um, you know that kind of that you know this is we're kind of saying to the audience it's not real. You know, I mean, this is those things. They're not happening. There's no such things as those are. And um, in the original cue, you know, it had that kind of surf guitars, and then it went into this kind of swing, jazzy, uh, a bit of that kind of Lalo Schifrin '70s feel to it, and and some of the points with all these kind of congas and drums and stuff. And it had a bit of that, but it wasn't really kind of kicking it. And then we had a lot of test screenings for the film, and. You know, we noticed that 
that didn't get us enough of that kind of kick that we wanted. So everybody loved the queue. I mean, the queue was working. Nobody said it doesn't work, but we, you know, like me and Evod, we felt that we can maybe try and push it a bit more and thinking, okay, we, we got the whole score and we kind of, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of left field. There's a lot of stuff that's mainstream and it's, you know, it's what you want in an action queue or this and that, but, you know, let's kind of try and take it out completely. And we thought, well, yeah, you know what? Mariachi band. Mariachi band and a Baroque orchestra that will do the trick. And, and that's kind of like, you know, and that's kind of like when we went and we got the mariachi band doing everything and recorded the vocals and all that. And then, and we, as we were playing and stuff, I started to think, you know, like mariachi band, you know, da -da -da, sombrero. Eh, let's shout sombrero at the end of the queue, you know, when the guy got his head splashed and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we got a choir there, you know, and, and me and some other people, you know, shouting sombrero and uh, the whole thing. And it just, it just became this cue that's like completely out of proportion, you know, and it worked a lot of the, I think from a lot of the fight scene in the film, but what people I think remember is actually that clinic scene. You know, even the one that hates the film, I mean, this film, either you like it or you hate it, but even the one who hates the film kind of love the clinic film, uh, the, the clinic uh, fight scene, because that's like the one that's like, it's just so out of proportion, but it's, but you get the idea of it, you know, and it works great. And it still has that kind of Baroque feel with the harpsichords, but then it has all this kind of crazy Mexican shouting there, you know, so it, it worked well, yeah. And, but that's... that, but again, that's the thing that when you have a bit more time and then, you know, they allow you to, you know, great, that works. But what happened if we push it a bit more to, you know, let's do, you know, we got that. So that's covered. But what if we do another take of that and go completely left field? So you don't expect it to, you know, to come because just before that, you know, you have like quite a long queue, which also is like crazy meterings, like 13.8. And and it's like, you know, it has that kind of bit of comedy, but it has that kind of normal action feel to it. And then it kind of ends and then it starts with that crazy stuff that you don't expect. So yeah, when you got a bit of extra time, that's what you spend it on. <laughs> yeah. With you know, with that extra time though, do you ever get worried that you're gonna take things too far and you know, just experiment too much or go too crazy and and make things um, a little worse off? Um no, I mean, I mean, you know, if you have the extra time, I mean, it depends on, on you know, directors you work with, you know, some were, were very specific and, you know, they love what you do and it's there. And, you know, I've done certain things that I've added all these kind of dissonance sometimes and I like to put certain, you know, weird stuff. Sometimes it's like small details. And then I'll always kind of, you know, give it as a separate stem or when we mix, you know, I always say to, to Casey, my engineer, just, you know, just put a separate stem. If they don't like it, they can take it out, you know, or, okay, they don't like it. We love it. Well, keep it for the album, you know, so it'll be the album version. And um, with Navot, you know, Navot is very open-minded, you know, when he likes certain things, he loves it. And, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll go very mainstream. And then sometimes we'll have moments where it goes, you know, we need to go over the top. So like, like the milkshake scene at the beginning of the of the film between um, Scarlett and Sam, you know, it's a mother and daughter, but our, you know, our kind of big milkshake moment, you know, could have been, you know, it could have been the the big, you know, climax of Casablanca in that sense. It's so, you know, grandeur and like, it's so romantic and it's like, it's, you know, you would not really associate it with a mother and daughter moment, you know, but that's like our Disney big fall in love moment, you know, and we went and it works really well, even though you would think, oh, maybe, you know, it's a bit too romantic, but actually it does, you know, it makes this connection. So, yeah, a lot of it depends on, you know, who's the director and how much they are kind of willing to, you know, to incorporate. And even when we did some of the stuff, we, we did have comments from the studio saying, um, you know, some of it sounds a bit too retro, you know, and we're afraid that it might be a bit too retro and not kind of modern, you know, or appealing to more, uh, you know, the younger crowd that loves all the kind of modern scoring stuff, this, but, you know, but then, you know, as we started adding more 
elements and more electronic stuff, they saw that that combination of a bit of the retro stuff and the electronics that started to come underneath. And it's not just the old school kind of orchestra and instruments. They go like, oh, wow, okay, that's a, that's a, oh yeah, we love that. That's a great, you know, colors and stuff. So again, you know, when they allow you to do that, it's the best part, you know, sometimes you do stuff, which is by the book, which is great. But then when they do allow it to, then, and that's the best, I think, you know, yeah, there's, there's time when you think, oh, okay, maybe I've gone a bit too much, you know, <laughs> like maybe it's a bit, uh, you know, uh, too over the top. Um, and then, you know, usually you get a comment saying, but then you always have a version that's a bit, you know, you do a version that a bit more kind of subdued and it's great. And then, you know, you have a version which is like a bit over the top and you see, you know, you see what work I've done. I've done a film which was, was quite a big success called Noodle back in, I think it was 2007. And, um, we, you know, we, we, I worked with this director and she was really, she was really musical and she goes, why don't we do an end title song? And and since it was a, a film about this kind of um, uh, Chinese kid who's been left behind and his parents been deported and this uh, stewardess who wants to then reunite the kid with his parents back in China. And so the director said, why don't we do a, you know, a song? And I said, yeah, why don't we do a song that, you know, it's going to be sang in there, you know, in Mandarin. And we got this uh, girl to write the lyrics in Chinese and in uh, Mandarin and, um, and we just went in, recorded, recorded the orchestra, recorded the song and stuff. And I remember in, in when we did the preview, the producer was like, we're like, you know, we're there sitting saying, what the hell, is, what, what's the hell is, what's the deal with the song? I mean, you know, A, it's in Chinese and stuff. And it's like, why, do, why are we doing it? You know, like, it's just, it feels so, you know, out of context and stuff. And the director was saying, no, I love it. And it works great. And he left it. And actually, everybody loved the song at the end, you know. So, you know, it depends, depends on many, so many factors. But yeah, when they give you the opportunity and the director backs you up, then it's the best. Yeah. Well, that I mean, that's got to be such an important aspect because, you know, there are so many people working on a film. And I don't think the, you know, well, I think composers are important. You know, the the composers don't necessarily ish. have the biggest <laughs> yeah, yeah, ish, but, yeah. But you don't necessarily have the biggest sway with the you know, the studio or the producers in trying to keep some of your changes. So that's gotta be really nice when you know the director has your back hundred percent because yeah. suddenly, you know, it, it the uh the studio or producer pressure is alleviated a bit. And you know, talking about the importance of directors, I know that uh, you, you and Devote, the director have worked on quite a few things over the years. So, I mean, how how does that like, long-standing relationship help or change how you uh, how you approach and how you score the film? Um, well, with him, I mean, with Nevot and, you know, some other directors I work with, but especially Nevot, we have a very, you know, Nevot is very musical, which is great. Um, so he will... Um, a lot of time, as I said, he will, you know, start compiling a list as he starts to write the script and, uh, you know, we'll come up with ideas and, and things to do. And even now we're, we're kind of like in super early stages on doing gunpowder too. And, um, you know, we already kind of started, you know, mumbling, okay, well, we know the themes, we know what we have, how do we do, you know, how we take it to 11. You know, so we have our themes and we know who's going to be probably in, in number two or what's going to be, you know, who died in this one, but, you know, or who's going to be those kind of characters and such. And, you know, we have our kind of baseline established, but how can we now take that baseline forward? And we start, you know, okay, we can go to this direction and we obviously can go to this direction. Uh, so with him, I think it's, we kind of started having that kind of language, I think, when we did Big Bad Wolf, because Rabies was a was a rescue job for me. They had some other composer doing it, and I just kind of came quickly in. And um, so it was, a, you know, within two weeks, I'd done Rabies, and it was great that uh, then we moved on. And then when Gun and uh, sorry, when Big Bad Wolf came about, that's kind of like when we we started kind of, you know, there were. It would tempt the film with certain things. And I go, okay, I can see this. I can see where you're going with that. And it went, I think, on Big Bad Wolf, it went from something like 
I think it was Batman Return or uh, was it Bat? You know the um, the Dark Knight or something like that. And then it went to you know Die Hard for Michael Kamen, and it was a bit of ET there at some point. And it was a, it's a huge combination of you know of cues that were just splattered all over. And um, you know, so I saw what he was doing, and I said, "Okay, I, I can see what you're doing here." But I think, yeah, this scene, you know, with the kind of diehard mo- movie music is is a bit too serious to what's on screen. But what if we do it this way, but then kind of try and make it a bit more comedic and stuff? And that's how we started to shape that kind of playlist. And that's how we kind of started on uh, was the ABC of Death uh, segment. And then when it came to came to Gunpowder, we already kind of established that thing. So when I know that what's you know, will say, I'm thinking of doing this and doing this and doing this. And I go like, how the hell is that going to happen? But I say, okay, I can <laughs> see where you're going with it. All right, let me go to the lab, cook something up, and then we'll start doing that. So, and we'll, you know, and we'll kind of start and because he's musical, he will start, what if we do this? Or what if we create something like this with a synth? And I go, okay, I can see where you're going with that. That wouldn't work, but what if I do and I take it and I kind of move it like this and do it like so we have our you know we have our shortcuts kind of a thing with with trying out things and then what he will do a lot of times he would um, he will just you know take my sketches and start putting them on the film and then start editing you know sit with the music editor or he'll do it himself and kind of you know start putting them around and moving things and go what if we do this and this and i will go i think this part works better here but i can combine this with this part you know and and we kind of have this almost like it's almost like having a certain jigsaw that you kind of take reshuffle and rebuild again and it it seems to work well you know gunpowder i think is is like a good because that was like our you know kind of super big movie with so much music and so much influences in one film to do as a, as a, as a kind of, a, and it, it's always, I would say it's always a certain journey with Navot, the way it works is we'll start with like our initial direction and we'll, we'll go almost 180 sometimes, uh, which producer are not a big fan of because it's like <laughs> why we're going this and now we're going that, but you know, it's, it, it's a learning curve in a way. And then, uh, you know, and he needs to see that kind of journey or this kind of realization sometimes. And and as well for me, it, it kind of makes certain things clear because I say, you know what, that's great. But you know, that thing that we did at the beginning, which was, you know, out of context with the film, actually, I think that will work here. So let's bring that in and then add our elements from where we are now. And And it works really well, you know, but again, sometimes you have the time for that and sometimes you don't you know when we have, we'll see when we have you know just a month or two months to work we'll hopefully <laughs> that shortcut will be very quick you know and not a year so yeah let's see luckily you have you know a crazy lead time right now with uh with the sequel yeah 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 exactly so i haven't started on that and i'm you know there's still time on that they're just writing so still very very early days but yeah. but that's the thing you know this uh, like when i worked on ghost stories um you know Andy and Jeremy, they're very, you know, music orientated and they knew exactly what they wanted. And, you know, we, we done, we done stuff once we had the themes, um, you know, they were super hundred percent behind me. And I said, what if we go this direction and we do this crazy thing and we add this and, you know, you know, again, you know, it all depends if they give you the leeway, then it, you know, you can just go and experiment and do research and certain things. And, uh, did the same, you know, the same thing when on the operative, it was, it was meant to be mostly a, an electronic score. And then I said, why don't we have this kind of huge brass and, and, you know, string section, just like mostly on the lower end. And then you well director said, you know what? Yeah, that sounds good. And the studio said, yeah, we're willing. Okay, let's go with that. And then, you know, when they got to the mix, then they kind of had a bit of a change of heart and they said, let's push a bit more the electronic part and, you know, mute the orchestra um but then you know just release it on the soundtrack so yeah that's how it works you know so it depends you know sometimes the studio will just give you the notes and they'll say we want this we want that and it it, i think it depends how much leeway the director would have compared to the studio um but yeah but when you have test screenings uh 
you know, and, and so many people and music editors and supervisor, then yeah, everybody will make a comment and then you think, you know, let's see what works best. And then, yeah, we go with that. So not always, e not always easy for us to compose our though, but yeah, <laughs> part of it. Yeah. So with, with gunpowder, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'll guess that that's the kind of biggest production, biggest, uh, studio film that you've worked on. Did it feel Today, like there yeah. was there was, you know, more uh, kind of more external influences, more people trying to give comments, and and was that like an added level of pressure? And and you know, you've mentioned test screenings a couple times as well. Um, yeah, Gunpowder, I would say, is the biggest one because of so many um, because of the studio and so many kind of big producers involved and. And and budget wise as well, I mean it's quite a huge budget. And um, I mean even Ghost Stories, Ghost Stories had a fairly big studio behind it, but they were very kind of, uh, you know, they took a back seat. They weren't interfering, you know, they weren't interfering. And Ghost Stories, we had I think like maybe, I think like over ten test screenings. They the studio did, um, but they never kind of made any comments about you know the score or anything. They were, they were like, yeah, we trust the directors. You know we're happy with that um i mean it's funny like when you you know when you always speak to kind of young composers or that everybody wants to do the big films and the big movies but the thing is that those big 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 ones especially you know um they have so much pressure and uh, people kind of relying on you usually you know it's like it's going to be the summer this or the hit of that and this and that and there's so much pressure that to deliver so if you know uh, you know the leaders surround you with loads of people that will get it done and they'll have backup composer doing you know ghost writing and stuff like that and uh, um and here yeah we had you know we had a lot of kind of a lot of pressure uh from from kind of like the, the studio and the, you know and and the producer about you know um at first they were they were like very um unsure with the direction we want to take it they're kind of like why are we going to that kind of you know retro spaghetti western feel they they saw it i think more as a you know your kind of action movie thriller and um you know we kind of said from the start no this is actually it's a different type of movie and the music will reflect that as well so um, I think once it's been shot and then Nevot kind of started and the music editor, Gareth, they started temping the stuff in. I think uh, or, I think originally it had like a bit of more of that kind of, um, you know, action thriller music inside, you know, and it was temped with that. And they could see that it's not really, it, it worked on certain scenes, but it, not, it wasn't giving them that kind of, extra flavor and something unique that that we were looking for and then once i started kind of putting in the sketches and the theme and then the kind of sound that started to fit each character and the signature sounds then it started like oh okay we, got, we can see where you're going with it okay we love it you know and like and then um i think uh yeah we didn't we did real one to three and then and then the comment from the studio i remember coming in was like um I think was like, okay, what's going to be with the big action scenes in real six and seven? Like how we get, you know, how's that going to sound? You know, is it going to work with that kind of, you know, spaghetti Western retro kind of, you know, sixties French feel to it. And, um, you know, and then I said, no, you know, that's, the, that's where we kind of go through, you know, like the full kind of electronics and that kind of full comic marvel type you know big bombastic stuff with the choir and the music and, and the orchestra and all that and then so they said okay can you just skip you know part of the reels and go straight into the big action scene because they were just were a bit uh, nervous about the whole thing um so that that kind of we went straight into that and then i've done those big scenes and then once they've heard it it's like yeah it's all good we're happy with that. Do what you want to do. So that, <laughs> yeah, once those done, because they were like super freaked out about, you know, uh, delivering those. And I think for me as well, like, and I've done loads of action scenes, but not to that size, 
um and they were quite big action scenes and uh but they wanted you know they wanted that kind of big marvel uh approach to those scenes fighting scenes but yet some you know those kind of hybrids action cues and but once they've heard them uh they were like yeah we're super happy you know that they just left us to do what we want to mm. do you know and they left us alone there was no more comments or anything so their comments actually funny enough were like you know i had to present the demo of the of the main theme and stuff so once they've heard that they were happy but then they just heard like the odd cues coming in and out um and then they were like okay what's happening with the action so once that's done everybody was kind of chilled out about it um nobody made any comments they were just like uh i think the test screening um, that they did, it was just like more of uh, people, do you like the music? You don't like the music? People said, yeah, everybody said we love the music. So nobody kind of messed anything or anything. Then we had like notes again from the studio saying we need to put more songs into the film. Well, tomorrow's more towards Nevot actually. And I think then funny enough, we, there's uh, one, two, three. So there's like three big, big action scenes. So then they took two of the, the cues from the, from the action scenes uh, and they put, uh, one was uh, uh, David Bowie song and the other one was the Janis Joplin song. And then did a, they did a test screening and the audience um, loved, the, they loved the Janis Joplin uh, song in the fight scene, but then they preferred the score on on the on the original uh, test screening that we've done before, so David Bowie out put in back in the score, which is the till the death cue, basically. And that action scene that we we recorded that ended up as the um, end credits music, you know. So you know, test screening. There you go. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. But I think it. I think it was a good choice by them to really leave you alone because, and and you'd mentioned this before, where a lot of people's kind of immediate reaction, I think, when the film came out was thinking the movie was like a female John Wick almost. Yeah. But then when you when you watch it, both the scenes themselves and the music really shows it's a very different type of movie. I mean, yeah, like yeah, broadly, yeah. there are those similarities, but there's yeah. just a very different style and character and feel that comes through that I think would have been completely lost, had it not completely, but would have been uh, lost a lot and minimized had it been something much more, you know, just a straightforward action, more you know, marvelly, more pure kind of action electronic. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's And that's kind of like the sense that we got from uh, like the early test screening, um, including um, like one that I was, that, that we, we've done in London is, and, and that when it was still kind of tempted with loads of kind of, you know, uh, other soundtrack cues from different movies. And it, it had that kind of more action. It felt like it just wasn't, you know, as you say, it would, it would just it would make it another kind of action film but but it kind of didn't match what you were getting on screen, you know. And there's a, there's a story behind it, and all the characters, and it kind of like it just became like a nice wallpaper that you like to look at. But it's you know there there wasn't no substance, and I think that's where we decided. And I mean that's when the, I think the studio kind of said, okay, what you know, what's the approach that you guys wanted to take? And then we said, okay, let's let's show you because. The initial, like the opening cue is, is it has a combination of that kind of, uh, you know, kind of John Barry, you know, spy movies from, you know, those film noir feel to it. And then it kind of goes into that kind of big, big brass electronics and all that kind of stuff. And then, then they kind of realize, oh, those world can actually coexist. And it actually gives it a nice color, which you, you know, works well with, with, I think with that retro feel that the film has, but still kind of makes it a bit timeless. So when you watch the film, you know, um, you know, you're not sure what year it takes place. You think it's in the now. You're not sure what city it takes place. You know, it, it's and it's a bit of a timeless kind of place. You know, 
uh, which works great. And I think that's the main thing we wanted to achieve with that. Yeah. yeah but that, but, but that's think... the, yeah. I was gonna say, go, go ahead. No, I'm saying, so that's the thing is, is, you know, you get always these worries where the studio says, you know, we want it to be mainstream. And I think that was the main fear that we were taking it a bit too, too left field. And they felt like, okay, we might be pushing it a bit too much to one direction and the audience wouldn't get it. But then we said, but, you know, you only heard, you know, kind of like a couple of cues, you know, and, but as the film progresses and more characters coming in and the, the kind of, we can establish the themes and the feel to it, you know, there's more. And actually, I think it's from real four that you get like, it becomes a bit more of that kind of thriller, you know, hybrid score coming in as it kind of started to change and go into that kind of big battle scenes and all the baddies are starting to come in. So, you know, the music almost tells a story. So it starts specifically and then it kind of becomes a bit more. So, yeah, it's, it's again, you know, that's part of the, sometimes the scare that the studio goes, okay, we, you know, we've gone a bit off the edge here. Well, I hope music like this, I don't know, opens the mind of studios a bit more because I think that, I think audiences are actually very open to more, you know, a little more like creative, more out there music. You know, not every, like there's, like you take um, music by like Rezran Ross or Hans Zimmer, where it's not, like I wouldn't say it's experimental or anything, but it's still a very different type of sound than you'd hear in, you know, a lot of uh, other films you hear on the radio or something. You know, it's yeah. very droney and... You know, as long I think as long as you're not making just just pure noise or something that's totally mm. avant garde, yeah. I think audiences now are are sophisticated and open enough to have all sorts of music resonate with them. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, for me, melody and harmony is very important. So, you know, there's always room for doing some experimental, you know, abstract stuff, and I've done that. Um, you know, and, and some movies, you know, you come in that they just want, you know, the one note drone kind of thing and textures and you tr mm -hmm. you still kind of try and be a bit more sophisticated or try and create some sort of a melody or, you know, if, if it's if it's the feel of a sound or certain things. Um, but uh, I think, you know, and I think there's, there's certain films where, yeah, that kind of music kind of works in a sense. But I think even, you know, when you listen to uh Reznor and Ross and, and the stuff they do it's to, it has a melody you know a lot of the stuff has a sort of a you know if it's a riff or it's a, some sort of a hook there is that and Hans Zimmer today I think is more about those kind of riffs and hooks in and sometimes the the theme could be some sort of a specific sound like he did in Men of Steel boom boom that kind of you know two note thing or um and it works great and then you know and then you have like the, the, the kind of other side, which is that, you know, that kind of John Williams, um, you know, school of, of kind of proper, you know, melody that's spread out over loads of bars and music kind of keep changes. And and, and um, I think for me is, is to try and do a combination of both. But and for Nevot as well, Nevot is like he, he's very big fan of melody and harmony. So um, it was very important to try and do something that will be very kind of almost like a earworm, you know, that will catch you. It'll be repeated, but not to a point where you go, oh, my God, not that theme again. You know, <laughs> oh, my God, it's like, come on. So even with the fifth variation enough, you know, because sometimes, yeah, you get it as a repeat or the music, you know, the, the director will say to the music, editor, just keep using one piece or, you know, so even when we used it, it was like in so many combination. And it was always somehow there in the background because it's like, a, you know, it's very catchy and it's very warm. But again, you know, something that I can write and if you think it's catchy, I don't know if the audience will think it's catchy, you know, like my taste, not necessarily the audience, but you write, you don't really write something that, um, you know, um, the audience, you write something that the director hopefully would love. And, you know, when I played stuff to them and, and we play the main theme and stuff, you know, uh, he goes, oh, yeah, I, I can't stop listening to it. It's so catchy and stuff. We go, yeah, we got it. That's good. Okay, we're happy. <laughs> you know, send it to the producer and see what they say, you know. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, I think melody and harmony is very important. And I think today, 
you know, it, it's it's like a cycle, you know, it, it may not be going back to maybe the full orchestral kind of scores that you, you would listen to for what they did back in, you know, 60s, 70s, and then during the 80s, it's kind of changed the electronic type again. And then it kind of went, came back again, but it, it's like a combination of things, you know, but there's always something interesting happening, you know, I think that's the best thing with that. Yeah, yeah, makes absolutely. It much more, you know, much more kind of catchy to the ear, you know, especially if you have a film that has so much detail and stuff that going, you know, uh, you know, there's only a limit to what your ear can sustain. So when you have something melodic and comfort, it's very, it's much more easy to the ear to, to catch on than, you know, abstract noises and stuff that coming in, no, you know, nonstop. So, I, I mean, I think directors today, some of them are, you know, some of them sometimes could be, you know, they're afraid of music because music, you know, could take over. But if you look at like, um, you know, if you look at like, say, The Great Escape and you listen to the music, it's very repetitive, you know, it's very catchy. And it's, and you can't escape it. it when you listen to the film mix, it, you, you know, even with the dialogue, you know, Elmer knew exactly what he was doing. You know, it still plays there. You still hear the melody, but it doesn't take you away from, what the characters you know are saying and stuff but you still remember the music you know and it needs to then it needs to build but the those melodies are still there under including percussion when you know when they're talking so it's a combination to do it right and you can get it to work and funny enough with gunfather you know we you know i said to Navot that we're we're kind of going to that direction where even when you know we have scenes where it just no action and their the characters are talking we actually have melodies going it's not just one note or a bit of string playing it's literally we have melodies playing under you know and for him it was fine you know it was never about you know what's going to be the struggle in the mix of bringing down the music because it's interfering you know we knew from the start that we're going to that direction of those that kind of school of thought of like you know we we play it melody we play it catchy and you know, even when there's character talking, you know, and that's, I think, the best combination. And it can work, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's just that tough balance of yeah, not yeah. burying it so much, but not having it take over. Uh, you've, you have yeah. to find that that little Goldilocks zone in between. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing is, is you know, it's the right orchestration, it's the right kind of instruments when, when you got all those people talking. So, yeah. And the right, yeah. you know, film dubbing mix that can make it all work now i want to i want to change gears real quick we're we're running near the end but there's something that i, I did want to ask about before we finish up so i know i do know that one of the things that you know got you interested in film music and pushed you on the path to becoming a film composer was um was meeting the german composer klaus doldinger mm. and i think you were like 14 at the time it was when he yeah. was working on uh, the never-ending story yeah. Which, you know, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but the the U.S. version of the film and the score is very different. You know, it has a lot of uh, work by Giorgio Moroder, and I've never yeah. I've never actually heard uh, Klaus's original version, and I don't think a lot of people here have, uh, which which is a shame. Um, yeah. But you know, what was what was that experience like, and what part of that meeting, you know, helped further solidify that path for you? Um. I mean, for me, it, it's kind of started, I think, even before when I got like this um, LP from, from my dad from, uh, it was uh, was was the, um, the Big Gun Down by, by Ennio Morricone. And, and I think that kind of planted the seed, you know, because I used to go when I was like, you know, seven, six, seven, eight, I used to go with my dad and watch all these kind of Douglas Fairbanks movie and you know Aaron Cohn Gold music and all these kind of pirates movie and and uh, Robin Hood and westerns and all this kind of stuff and and I started you know I started kind of becoming fascinated with music but I didn't kind of make the connection of like you know cinema and music you know writing you know I didn't know that concept of somebody wrote that music for this film you know and um you know so i got that lp and i used to play it a lot and and um but i was still doing you know i still kind of 
was interested in music, but more as a, you know, being in a rock band from my teens and all that kind of stuff and electronic music and listening to Howard Jones and 80s music and all that kind of stuff. And then um, when we went to one time on a trip, yeah, it was Bavaria Studio. It was right when they were filming The Never Ending Story. So they got us on set, you know, so we saw the, the animatronics and Falcor and all the big, you know, the big sets and all that kind of stuff. And I think they were in a break from, from filming. And somehow, you know, it kind of got to the point. I think it was in the cafeteria or something. Uh, and I think Klaus Dullinger was, I think probably, I think it was, I guess maybe it was the uh, the director. Um, uh, I think it was Wolfgang Peterson, I think was the director. Mm -hmm. And um, and they were chatting and I was like, oh, I love music and I, I play synth and i play trombone and i play this and this and I just kind of like and then um and then funny enough klaus said well you know we're doing a few cues for this for the movie that you know uh, here that we're filming in this why don't you come down to the studio and you know we can watch record a live recording of of, of of how the magic happened and um yeah i just i went uh i think it was was in in munich i think it was that they recorded some of it. And then um, I went and, you know, I, I still kind of didn't really put the two together, but I felt like, whoa, wow. You know, <laughs> that's like, you know, you hear the orchestra playing and it's, it's you know, those cues. I can't even remember which cue it was, but, but like just hearing the orchestra playing and all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I think, I think that kind of planted the seed somehow, you know, back in the head, like, wow image music but but then it was just like you know being in a rock band and touring and being a runner and a t-boy in a studio learning how to operate the desk and all the kind of stuff and reverb and creating your own sound because i always said oh you know i'm doing electronic music and i want to create this kind of sound how do i go about it so i was doing all of that and and then one day I had a call from uh, from a friend of mine in in London saying, "Hey, you're good with synth. I'm doing this. I'm helping uh, doing this show called The Chancer with Clive Owen and Jan Hammer. You know the the famous Jan Hammer, the composer. So you want to do some synth programming and this? And I'm like, hell, shit, yeah, no, I'm, I'm on it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Got the Roland R8 and this, and we do you know program some sound and do that, and then." I, so I've done that, and then it's it, it just kind of started. I felt like mm, music and doing you know TV shows and films and stuff, but then um, then I just kind of went and did some theater stuff. So I wrote music for theater for a while, and then then I kind of started doing films, and and then I think it just like oh that feels so natural to me. Watch the image, get the inspiration from the story and the, and um, you know and the drama of of. of you know the the written words and what you get and it's like oh that feels so natural so then you know you just start going doing that and you do this and you do this for free and you do this and before you know it and i i, I didn't even do i think short films i was just doing you know i just got to ask uh, to do you know features and we were they were still editing film you know 35 mil so my first films were actually done on 35 mil and and I remember, you know, I met I met Andy Morricone back in the day and had chat with him. And I met Earl Egan and I got a clickbook. So I learned how to do how to do the frame by with a clickbook. And uh, you know, I, I still remember my first film, which was some Israeli film that I've done. And I still remember how I messed up the scene that my music ended two frames prior to when it needed wow. to end. And and yeah, you know, record your orchestra, you do what you do, and you watch it and you go, well ends before oh, but yeah you know, director they didn't know nobody noticed but i still remember the scene you know it's like imprinted in my head i i miscalculated with the with the, the click frame what i needed with the book and the tempo and um you know then i met um i met Schaefer and i met um um i met a few of you know a few of the old school kind of guys that kind of gave me advice through this site because I never went to like you know I never learned to write for film so anything I, I've learned is because I met you know all these amazing composers that in a way I've looked at them you know as mentors including you know uh, Ennio Morricone for me so and and that's kind of like 
you know, shaped everything to think like, okay, that's the natural thing. But yeah, it's all started with, you know, getting that small, you know, LP to listen to. And then, you know, being on in the in first time for a 14 year old kid to be in a studio where you see an orchestra, where up until now, you know, for me, it was just listening to classical music, growing up and, and soaking everything I could, but not like watching a real orchestra playing, because I've never been in a concert, I've never been on any of those kind of things. So watch an orchestra playing, and then you get the big screen in the back and they're, you know, recording and you get the screen, you look at it and you go, I just seen that film, you know, I saw that those animatronics, I just saw them in on the stage next door and you see that now playing and you go, okay, you know, and that's, yeah, that was, that's, never forget that. Oh, that's, that's so cool. Yeah, so, I, so, I, that, so the thing, the, the thing is, I, there, I think there is an album uh, that someone released, I'm not sure if it's a bootleg or not, but there is um, uh, there is an album which is a double sided, which is just has much of more of Klaus music mm. of the orchestral stuff than compared to you know I mean it's still the same music I think that they just needed to they wanted to do it a bit more updated so they added you know all the kind of Giorgio Moroder stuff that we know you know and the untitled song but a lot of that score is there as just an orchestral score. All right, I'll have to I'll have to look for that because I've yeah you know I've I've seen that movie who knows how many times uh, yeah. ever since I was probably like five years old so I know. it'd be good to see the or at least hear the original. Yeah, I mean, that's the funny thing. I I kind of befriended uh, Limal on I think it was on Instagram and stuff, and there was a chat about the Neverending Story, and I said, oh, you know, actually when I was fourteen, I was on the <laughs> I was on those recording sessions, you know, like when they were recording, you know, all these kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think that, that's, that's what, yeah, I mean, I mean, those are the things that you kind of cherish, you know, um, and I think that's kind of give you the experience of, you know, watching, um, you know, watching these people work. And I think that's the best way also to learn is watching all these kind of things being done, you know, um, and the more you watch and you're kind of like a fly in the wall, but you can you soak so much in how everything works backstage because that's one of the things I think they don't really teach is how all this mechanism behind works. You know, we spend most of the time in the small room mm -hmm. writing stuff out. And then you kind of, you know, the biggest enjoyment is when you go to the stage, even though there's a lot of pressure there as well, but it's when you go to the stage and you get the orchestra to play and everything that goes on. So yeah, those moments are the cherished ones. Yeah. I mean that it's that just has to be such a magical moment at that age. It was. I couldn't yeah, even yeah. imagine it. Yeah, I mean for me, you know, for me it was just playing, you know, trombone and playing some keyboards and synth. And it's like you never visualize, wow, an orchestra can play your music. And it's like, you know, my dad, uh I'm still alive, always every time I, I remember my dad was a violinist when I went through the Holocaust and that. And every time I back in the day I did a score. I used to play it to him and he was as far, even though he was a violinist and stuff he always said you need more brass and more bass so for me today it's the, the best things to write for brass and when i you know i said that kind of brings me i think to the never-ending story and all these kind of brass writing because klaus is a sex uh he plays the saxophone and stuff so he comes from that kind of background and uh you know so for me it's always like woodwinds and brass is like the main kind of instruments i want to hash out and as much as I can in the session, you know, <laughs> strings are great, but the brass and the winds, yeah. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. All right. I mean, what a good note to end on. Uh, yeah, definitely. Frank, um, <laughs> great talk to you. I'm, I'm so glad you could join me. My pleasure. Um, and it was, it was great watching the film and listening to your score a few times as well. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely.